Hello everyone, welcome to the first ever Science Breaks event. Uh, I'm Medina, I'm a PhD student at Imperial College London and I'll be your chair for today. Um, so I'm really excited to uh, introduce the speaker for this first event, Professor Chris Jackson, who is a professor who researches um, volcanoes and other aspects of Earth sciences here at Imperial. Now, Professor Jackson started his career in um, the University of Manchester, where he did his undergraduate degree and later his PhD. And he then moved to Norway um, to work as an exploration research scientist for a few years before coming back to the UK and coming here to Imperial in 2004. And he's been with us ever since. And during this time, he's done some really um, pioneering and award winning research looking at different techniques to try and understand a 3D structure of volcanoes and specifically really ancient volcanoes that are millions of years old. And he's hoping that this work helps us understand how modern active volcanoes form and um, evolve over time. So because of his field expertise um, and his expertise with uh, volcanoes, Professor Jackson was approached by the BBC to take part in a documentary se series in 2017 called Expedition Volcano. So here, Professor Jackson and a team of other scientists traveled to the D Democratic Republic of Congo, where they were studying um, a couple of active volcanoes. And this uh, documentary series is really interesting. If you haven't already seen it, I highly recommend watching it. You get to learn not only about the science of the volcanoes themselves, but also about the communities that live around them and the kind of human impact of what it's like to live uh, next to an active volcano. So that's one reason why I'm really excited to introduce Professor Jackson today. Um, but actually, my expertise isn't in earth sciences. I'm a life science researcher. And one of the reasons why I think this is going to be a really great talk is because Professor Jackson has is a really great communicator um, of his research and makes it really accessible to, to everyone to be able to understand. So he's done a lot of talks at schools um, and just a wide range of talks to all types of people. He's also been an absolute champion for making science and universities as welcoming and as inclusive to everyone as possible. Um, so I'm really excited to introduce his talk today. Before we start, um, just a couple of points on how the event's going to run. Uh, if you've got any questions for Professor Jackson, you can just submit them in the Q&A on the side of the screen. Um, there's also um, an option to um, like or thumbs up some questions that have already been typed. So I'll try and go through the more popular questions first. Um, you can include your name in the questions that you submit, but you don't have to as this event is being recorded. So if you want to remain anonymous, just don't don't use your name. Um, please don't include any other personal details. Otherwise, we won't be able to ask your question. And there's going to be a couple of minutes after Professor Jackson's talk just for you to be able to collect your thoughts and ask any questions if you don't think of any during the talk itself. So I think that's it for me and I'll happily pass over to Professor Jackson. Yes, hello everybody. Um, I'm coming to you live here from my uh, daughter's bedroom in West London and this is just to show you that science happens in peculiar places at the moment in terms of Covid. So a, a volcano may strike you as odd but a small child's bedroom in West London is even stranger. Um, so thank you for joining me today. It's a pleasure to uh, present at the first um, science breaks and and also to those of you who maybe have had a chance to watch the TV show Expedition Volcano. And what I want to do today is talk a bit about exploring volcanoes and these are volcanoes both old and young. So as you can see here on this first slide and um, we can see on the left hand side side we're looking at a volcano which is 42 million years old and I'm going to talk about how we image those volcanoes and how we understand those volcanoes grew tens of millions of years ago and then also link it to what we showed in expedition volcanoes like why would this knowledge be useful for us as scientists so i'd like to start off though by saying ta to some people because science doesn't work in a vacuum of course and that's a really important thing for everybody to know is it's it's often teamwork and the people who've been very instrumental in the work that I'm going to show today are Craig McGee at the University of Leeds and Chiliang Sun at uh, China University of Geosciences in Wuhan. And, it, and, it's, and it's through their work really that we've gained a, a kind of really improved understanding 
of, uh, of, of these ancient volcanoes and their, their underlying networks, so their volcanic plumbing systems. So when you think about volcanoes, this is probably a classic image you have in your head of the dangerous um, adventure seeker in a heat resistant suit trying to collect what we call zero age lava there with a hammer. And it all looks really kind of sketchy and exciting and dangerous, but it's really important science that's going on there because this person here is trying to understand the chemical composition and some of the physical properties of the lava to understand where that lava came from. So where the magma was that fed that lava from that volcano, but also then the related hazard associated with the flow of these types of lavas. We can also look at this person on the right here who's sampling gases coming out of a volcano, in this case sulfur dioxide and carbon dioxide, and it looks equally as sketchy and equally as dangerous and terrifying, but it's very important work because if we can sample the gases, we may have a sense as to the amount of unrest of the volcano. What's the likelihood the volcano may erupt if we see changes in these different types of gases? And you can see that both of these people are working on active volcanoes. So these are volcanoes that are presently still active. And, and I'm going to show you about some techniques to look at these really, really old volcanoes as well. And that's going to require me to get you all into my head and into the things that I work with, which is reflection seismology, which is essentially a very fancy scientific term for taking an X-ray of the Earth's subsurface. And so the Complete Idiot's Guide to why rocks and wiggles are related. So why do the rocks you pick up on the beach ultimately look like some of the images I'm going to show you in the rest of this talk? Here's a simple diagram to show you how that works. So here we have a boat and behind this boat is a source of acoustic energy, so sound waves. And that sound waves in this particular acquisition, because this is at sea, is produced by a giant bubble that's popped behind the boat. And that energy you can see goes down into the Earth's subsurface. So these black lines go down and they bounce back up off these different layers of rock. And we listen and hear those sound waves using these things called hydrophones. And you can see these hydrophones are trailing behind the boat. So the boat goes back and forth and back and forth, boom, 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 creating this three dimensional image of the Earth's subsurface. And there's a number of reasons why the density of those rocks, the speed at which those sound waves travel through those rocks, they combine to dictate how we see the subsurface of the Earth. So what do these images look like? So I'm going to take you straight away into a really exotic part of the world. So we're not going to go to Congo, we're going to go to offshore southern Australia. So these are the sorts of data I'm going to show you and these are the sorts of data I work with. So let's start off. This grey area here is seawater. This, this line I'm tracing out here is the seabed. So this now beneath the seabed, this, all these kind of colours you're seeing are all an x-ray beneath the earth offshore southern Australia, as you can see in the little map. And what's really important here is scale. This scale bar here is 10 kilometres and this scale bar here, the vertical scale bar, is about 400 metres or so, so about half a kilometre. So take it from me, this is a big, big, big picture of what's going on underneath the Earth's subsurface offshore Australia. And the line I'm going to show you is about 70 kilometres long. So what are we seeing in this image? Well, the first thing my eye is drawn to are these big cones. Hopefully everybody can see that there's these triangular cones that look like hills or mountains. And in fact, that's what they are. They are volcanoes. They're ancient volcanic mountains, which we're imaging now buried beneath about three or four hundred metres of sediment offshore of southern Australia. Now, what's really cool about this is the blue horizon here I'm tracing out. That blue horizon is the 42 million year old horizon. It's it's Eocene is the is the time period in Earth history. And you can see those volcanoes are sitting on that blue horizon. So we know that these volcanoes are 42 million years old and luckily they're extinct. And luckily we can image them with this, this technique I showed you in the last slide. So I might, let me take you on a tour. And now we're gonna scroll towards the Southeast and, and look here above the blue horizon. There's these big volcanoes in here, beautifully imaged in this seismic data. And if you look carefully inside where this V is pointing, we can see these different layers within this volcano and they're individual lava flows. So these are several tens of million year lava flows which all built up this large volcano. So having told you a little bit about the technique I use, this reflection seismology, and showed you a little bit how we can apply it to look at just generally how these volcanoes are distributed in time and space, what are the four 
cool new things I've learned about volcanoes since 2017. Now that is kind of next level PowerPoint animation skills there, um, informed by my eldest daughter. She told me to do that. Um, and what I wanted to do is kind of exciting for scientists, because often we talk about like, <laughs> you know, we're well known for things we did a long time ago. But and it's quite rare to have this really cool opportunity to tell you about some things I've learned since I came out of the volcano in the, in the middle of 2017. So what have we found out? And I'll show you four really neat things. So one thing is volcanoes are less than half the story. We all know volcanoes because we see them poking up out the earth. They form these big mountains. But and that's certainly the case. OK, so this is an image here from offshore China. Here's the scale. So this volcano here is about 150 meters tall, so about three times the height of Nelson's column. So it's a baby, really. And we can see that this volcano has a flat bottom. You can see this, this kind of X-ray through this volcano. And we can see the line drawn underneath shows that it's sitting on this green horizon. These volcanoes are a few million years old. But some of the volcanoes we're seeing is like this one here are a bit more complicated, aren't they? You can see the nice volcanic cone and this volcano again is poking out of the seabed offshore China. It's that big. It's still poking out of the seabed. But underneath we have this green area, which is a massive crater. So we see that the volcano, the cone, or what we call scientifically as the edifice, is just a part of the story. And we think that this tells us the following story. But before the volcano erupts, we have a thing called a dike coming up. So we have magma rising up in the Earth's crust and we get the kind of excavation of a crater. So we have these big like craters being formed underneath the volcano. And then through time, we start to fill in that hole, that crater with volcanic material until we're able to build the volcano itself. So we, these volcanoes have this much longer history and really catastrophic and energetic history. And think about this. If we were just walking out into the, 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 the field or we were just using Google Earth to look at volcanoes, we would not get this picture of what's going on underneath them. So this reflection seismology is really, really, really key to letting us look into the heart of these volcanoes, but also look underneath them. Lava flows are massive. That's another thing I want to tell you about. Lava flows are really extensive and they're also very erosive. So we're probably used to seeing images like this, and this was a very devastating um, eruption a few years ago in, in Kilauea. And you can see the houses for scale, it, it, it damaged property. It's obviously clearly a very um, kind of, um, it's kind of a very fraught experience to live through. And we look at these images from the top and we can see that these volcanoes, these, these lava flows can go on for kilometers. What we can't see really is what's going on underneath these volcanoes, whether they're um, volcanoes, these, these lava flows on, 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 on land or these lava flows in the sea, because it's hard to see underneath these things. What we did is we looked at some of these lava flows, again, using in this case some data from the South China Sea. So I've labelled a few things for you here. Hopefully now you're all reflection seismology experts. So here's the seabed. This is the seawater. This is the image. These are layered sediments we're seeing in here. Here's that volcano, that, that triangular cone. And we can see, I'm tracing out between the blue and the green here, this red black event. There's like a very bright package, a very rich colored package coming out to the right hand side for several kilometers. And that's a lava flow, which was sourced from this volcano. Now, the techniques we use, we can actually um, cut these data, we can slice them. So some of you may have seen X-rays or CT, well, CT scans. Um, if you've ever had an injury and you can see you can scroll through them, <clears throat> we can do the same with these sorts of data. So I can now with this data again say, what does that lava flow look like in three dimensions? I don't just want this, ni this nice 2D image, I would like to see it in 3D. And that's what it looks like. So what we can see in here, this is one and a half kilometers for scale, so a relatively small volcano here. This is the volcano, it's quite dim, so it's this purplish color, but then you can see these beautiful reds and greens coming away from the volcano. You can see one there and one there. And then you can see that lava flow kind of fans out, it branches out and I've included a little diagram here for you. So there's the volcanic vent and you can see these volcano lava channels, we call them lava flow channels and lava fans branching away. What you'll notice from that, the pinks, the yellows and the greens compared to this central V1, this central volcano, is there's lots and lots of material actually in the lava flows and, and the study we did, we found out only three to 50 percent of the material erupted from the volcano was kept within the main volcanic cone itself. 
most of the material, 50 to 97 percent of the material that came out of some of these volcanoes went into these very, very, very long run out, we say, these very, um, very runny lavas that went a long way away. So we're only capturing a small amount of the volume of, of melting material in the volcanic cone itself. There's lots of stuff around them. I also said lava flows were erosive and, and made this point that using these, these images um, tell us one thing, but don't tell us a full story about what's going on. And to return back to the, the offshore China work we've been doing, and this is a great place to work because the data are just so high resolution and the features are so beautifully imaged. And that's a good point for just general science uh, information there, is often your observations and your, your understanding are limited by the quality and the resolution of the data. So that's a really important thing to bear in mind. So here's a small volcanic vent in here. I've labelled it again. You see that little triangular shape. And we've got this very long run out lava flow. You can see this lava flow has gone. Here's the scale bar, one kilometre for scale. This lava flow has gone about three kilometres away from the volcano from where it came. What I want to draw your attention to is this I'm tracing out here. The volcano, the, the lava flow, the bottom of it is kind of flat, but then it jumps up and then it jumps up again and then it comes out here. The lava flow base is incredibly bumpy or another word we use for it, fancy science term is rugose. It's bumpy and lumpy. And we think that's because these lava flows, in this case, they were erupted onto a very wet, cold seabed. And, and we have that dense, hot lava flow kind of dredging or, or collapsing in to that wet sediment because that wet sediment is really weak and kind of scooping it up as it's flowing along. So we're picking up bits of that wet sediment and bringing it into the lava flow. And that's kind of interesting because what you're adding to the lava flow then is both chemically different materials in the sediments, but also water. So you're actually changing two properties of the lava flow as a function of how the lava flow is interacting with the underlying sediment. And again, it's one of those things that geochemically you may see in the lava flows in ancient systems, but it's really nice to be able to see the, the morphology, so the geometry at the bottom of these lava flows. And the last point I want to make is that volcanoes are, are leaky as well. So what do I mean by that? Well, if you think about lava rock, so igneous rock, it's crystalline and often it's got very, very low porosity and permeability. That means it's not like your bath sponge. It means it's like a great big dense lump of rock. Not much gas or water could ever go through a bit of rock you've got in your hand. And that's certainly the case for most igneous rocks. But some work we've done here suggests, as I've labelled in here, we can see the volcanoes at the bottom, these, these, these lumps. These are quite big volcanoes here. And overlying those volcanoes are a series of these lines, which I've shown in pink here. These are giant fractures. And these giant fractures are what we call normal faults, so fault lines in the earth above the volcanoes. And we think it's because the sediments which are wet above those igneous rocks, which are hard, are bending and fracturing. So you can see all of these cracks in the rock are all above the volcanoes. The final third thing to show you on this image before I show you a map is this, this area up in here. Can you see that it's very, very bright? We've got these reds and these blacks. And we think that these, we know from drilling, we know from drilling down here that these are, this, is, this is gas. So we know that these sediments here are very rich in gas. And these sediments over here have got less gas in. So we know there's this kind of relationship between the volcano, the fractures and the gas above, suggesting that the volcano somehow, even though these volcanoes are several tens of millions of years old, are somehow controlling fluid flow and gas flow very recently. So let's make a map of this level. I'm going to show you again. I'm going to slice the data um, where it says gas. And that's what we see. This is a big map. This is two kilometres for scale. So from here to about here is a kind of, you know, we're looking at something which is not far off the width across London, this map, so it's a, it's a big picture. Um, and you can see the reds there, and the reds are the pockets of gas we're seeing. And you can see there's a very discreet, very distinct pockets of gas. And if we animate here, I'm showing in purple the gas. The yellows are the outlines of the volcanoes, and the reds are these fractures, these fault lines. And we can see a very close spatial relationship between the gases and the volcanoes. And so it looks like these volcanoes are very leaky. And not only are the rocks within those ancient volcanoes very leaky, the way the rocks are fracturing above the volcanoes are allowing more gas to be focused through those volcanoes. 
So thank you for listening to me talk a bit about some of the science that excites me. Just going back to Mira Gongo here with my friend Kelly Yacovino to say to you, you know, there's lots of interesting work going on around volcanoes. Some of it is very top down analysis. So geochemical analysis like Kayla was doing in the show or petrological analysis like we showed in the show where you get lumps of rock and look at the crystals. But then there's this whole other domain of looking at volcanoes using geophysical techniques, so reflection seismology, and trying to understand the distribution of earthquakes below volcanoes as well. So in that respect, volcanoes are an amazing meeting ground for people who are genuinely and generally interested in science, physics, maths, chemistry, biology. There's, there's, there's a role in, in volcano science for a lot of those, those people. If you're interested in science and society, volcanoes threaten life, so it's a great thing to come and study. So thank you very much. That's all from me. Um, we're going to take a few moments break and then we that will give you some time to post some questions in the chat. So grab a cup of tea, coffee or whatever you fancy and then we'll return in a moment. Thank you.
Hello, welcome back everyone. Um, I hope you found that talk as uh, fascinating as I did and actually based on the amount of questions that we received it sounds like you have so we'll try and get through as many as we can but we do have a limited amount of time. Um, so Chris I'm going to start with one of the most popular questions which um, I'm sure a lot of people uh, are interested in. Eleanor who is age seven asks um, what did it feel like to be inside the creator? She says that she watched your TV programme so I guess she's curious about your experience. So um, it was an amazing, amazing experience. And like I said in the show, it was almost like being transported to another planet. Um, it was so alien, the landscape was, and the, and, the, and the sound of the lava lake was unlike anything I'd heard before. So I imagine the equivalent is I've only done like, you know, scuba diving a few times and went down to 20 metres, but it, was, it felt similar to that. It felt like I was going into this very alien environment, although it was very much on Earth. Um, so yeah, it was it was an interesting experience in that respect, just how different it felt, even though I was not that far away from you know a major city. Um, the smells were very different as well. There's the sulfur was coming out of these volcanic vents, so it smelt very unusual, and then it sounded very unusual. And then moving around in that landscape, it's you know I'm used to hiking and being in the outdoors, so that was probably the easiest thing about the experience of being in the volcano. And sleeping in a volcano is quite intimidating, though. Camping in a volcano is something I'd highly recommend, but hearing a lava lake churning outside your your bedroom at three in the morning is is is, is an unusual feeling. <laughs> Yeah, I can only imagine how that would feel. I guess it's kind of one of the reasons you see um, kind of those landscapes in like science fiction films and so on, because they just look so, like you said, kind of alien. Um, so moving on to the next question. Um, oh, we have <laughs> David who says he doesn't have a question. He just wanted to say what a great presenter you are. So <laughs> thank you. Glad thank that you've you. been able to. <laughs> I wonder if that's my mum writing in under a pseudonym, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, lots of people have liked it, so I'm not sure it's just your mum. <laughs> um, but moving on to some more questions um, about the kind of science around volcanoes, we've got a great question from Erin, who's 12 years old, who said that they read an article on a French science website that a very old and extinct volcano in the Eiffel area in Europe um, Bellinux, I don't know if that rings a bell, might be waking up because the land has risen by one millimetres and scientists have been monitoring the activity. So yeah. is it possible for an old extinct volcano to become active in a highly, um, a high density, density populated area? That's a very, very good question. And my mind is drawn to the word extinct and the difference between extinct and dormant because extinct carries with it a lot of baggage, right? You think that volcano is dead and buried and it's never going to do anything again. Dormant, which sort of means sleeping, has a very different connotation because that means something could then wake up and it could become active at a later time. And then we have active volcanoes which are shooting lava out into the air every day or every minute or every few minutes. Um, so maybe that's as much to do. I'm, I'm a little bit familiar with this case of, the, of, this, of this volcano. Um, and it just probably shows you, you know, we probably have, you know, we mislabel things when we don't really understand them or our observation as scientists, the window of observation we have makes us think it's sh too short to see that maybe the unrest at that volcano is over a longer time period than we've been able to observe. And so we thought it was extinct, but actually it was just dormant and now it's becoming active again. So I think the labels we use are very, very important and it probably goes to show that maybe we need to just be monitoring kind of some of these more recently active volcanoes and um, if they are as you make the good point in your question if they are in highly populated areas because they may have an elevated you know, an elevated geohazard risk to the to the local populace that's really interesting um and i think it ties in quite nicely um, with a question from Vicky who's asking why do some periods have a lot more volcanic activity than others and are we currently in a in a quiet spell of volcanic activity? All right wow um, so this question is interesting because it always makes me think of a graph somebody once showed me of volcanic activity through time and if you looked at this graph 
it would look like there's more volcanoes erupting. So, you know, it starts off at very low kind of levels of um, volcanic activity for like large eruptions, and then it kind of increases and it, it makes the Daily Mail science bit where people say we're all about to die from volcanoes. Um, and it looks like volcanoes, you know, the, the Earth is becoming more volcanic. But then if you plot on that graph the Earth's population and you plot on that graph the kind of the amount and quality of imaging of the Earth we have from satellites, those graphs look the same. So partly our belief that the Earth is becoming more volcanic is driven by the fact that the population is increasing. Therefore, there's more eyes on the volcanoes and people are perhaps living near volcanoes to give oral accounts of the activity. But also, even in those unpopulated areas, we have techniques which allow us to see those volcanoes erupting through their gas emissions, for example, things which even if there's no populations nearby, we previously didn't know about. So there's, there's probably an aspect of that to the, the notion that the Earth is more volcanic. And now I'm thinking on my feet and I'm wondering, given the link between volcanoes and plate tectonics, so the way that the kind of Earth's plates move around and, and, the, and, and volcanic activity, I'm wondering if there's a way of which there are periods in Earth history where volcanic or the plate tectonic motions lend themselves to more volcanoes, of course, because we get lots of volcanoes when the Earth's crust is being stretched in rift valleys, for example, and we get lots of volcanoes where the Earth's crust is being uh, a thing we call subduction, where it's being, where they're coming together. And so maybe there's different configurations of the Earth's tectonic plates, which mean that, you know, as we're, as we're dispersing the plates, we have more volcanic activity than when we're putting them together. I don't know, it's a good question. Thanks for that. I think it's um, really interesting and really speaks to that idea that in science, you don't know everything, <laughs> and you know <laughs> you're always trying to find out something new and there's always limitations to the knowledge of you know whether it's you know of humankind or the kind of techniques that you're using and i think just keeping that in mind that science usually gives more questions than it does answers is <laughs> is a really good thing to remind yourself of yeah. um i think one of the things that people usually ask when it comes to talks about volcanoes um, is I've got a question here from Lily Morgan who's asking if there are any any advancements regarding prediction technology which will allow um, earlier predictions of volcanic eruptions in the long term and not just in the short term. Yeah so as you saw in Expedition Volcano if you've seen it um, you know that the, I you know my, my view of this is it's 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 probably what science looks like more generally in terms of how we'll make advances it's by coming more integrative and becoming more um and becoming more about different scientists hello can you hear me hello can you yeah hear? We, we can hear you oh, i can hear you <laughs> sorry you froze and, and my the wheel of death is spinning on my laptop so i might just start teams on my phone in case we have to go to that <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so um, we, yeah, so we, you know, this idea of integrative science. So what we need are different techniques to all come together because we could get lots of um, false starts, couldn't we? On, um, I think I'm just going to skip over to my phone here, if, if this will allow me to, if Sam and the producers can still pick me up here. Um, yeah, so we end up we end up having this idea that it's, we can all bring a little bit of things to our understanding. So we could be looking at volcanic gases, we could be looking at seismicity from small earthquakes, we could be looking at how ancient systems evolved using this technique I've talked about. Um, I'm coming back on here. Okay. I'm seeing a recording here, so I'm not too sure if I'm I'm not live or seeing myself on here. I think I think we can hear you okay. Okay, carry on. That's <laughs> on fine. As um, you are, yeah, carry on as you um, <laughs> So I think, I think one of the, yeah, so, you know, that idea that if we all kind of bring these different techniques together, we can sort of advance our knowledge. And the reason I say that is because there's lots of false indicate, not false indicators. There's lots of changes in the behaviour of a volcano which happen that don't lead to an eruption. So you might have changes in the gases coming out, you might have some the ground deformation that we talked about in the French case, and we might think that's kind of indicative of the eruption about to happen, but then it all dies down. 
And what we really want, don't we? We want we want indicators from a number of things to come together to really make us more certain because we don't want to be telling people, you know, warning people all the time because almost you get kind of like fatigue from that. Uh, certainly in certain places where it's difficult to leave where you live. So I think that's a really important point as well is, um, you know, using science in a combined way to reduce the uncertainties. You spoke a bit at the end of your talk, Chris, about like all the different aspects that go into studying volcanoes or the different routes. And I guess now you've touched upon that again, saying it's it's not enough to just have one type of scientist or one type of person to look at look at these volcanoes. Um, and that leads me to a question from James Salmon, who's asking what a student should study if they want to go into this field. Oh, very good question. I'm going to say geosciences or earth sciences, of course, because that's great. Um, so geology, geoscience, earth science, they will give you a really good foundation, of course, because you'll learn about, you know, the internal workings of the earth, the composition of the earth, the way volcanoes work. You'll learn about geophysical techniques and so things I've talked about now, how you can apply them not just to volcano science, but to a, a broad range of questions about how the earth, well, what the earth looks like and how it behaves. You'll get all of those things. But if you're interested in things like maths and physics and let's say chemistry, they all have a massively significant role to play in, in, in volcano science. So like I referred to in, I think, my third slide, geochemistry, there's a field of geology called geochemistry, which is where you apply your chemical knowledge or your, your interest and passion for chemistry to geological questions. There's a field of geoscience called geophysics, where you would take your interest in maths and physics and forces and dynamics and you could bring them to answer questions about how the earth what the earth looks like and how it how it behaves so there's clearly you know and you know the same again for biology if you're interested in biology not necessarily maybe more immediately with volcano science but that there's a clear link to things something called paleobiology and understanding how you know and paleontology and then looking at how earth like life on earth evolved in in, in the deep time so there's lots of ways of coming into geosciences and I always make this joke that, you know, if you kind of go into, a, if you go into an earth science department, there's lots of like physicists, chemists and mathematicians like wandering around and biologists bumping into each other all in this building because they've all got these, they've all come into this building from kind of very different formal educations. And then they're kind of mixed in with people who may be like me who had a more straight up formal geology training. So if you're interested in STEM disciplines, um, yeah, this is probably a science, an area of science you could definitely get into. I really like the idea of kind of just curious scientists kind of wandering around, bumping into each other and just <laughs> <laughs> working together on things they find interesting. I remember I did some research um, a few years ago and I met someone who used to be a geologist and then became a biochemist. So I think it's just if you like science, Kind of any aspect of it or just if you're curious about the world you'll find your way to what you're what you're passionate about yeah um and kind of following from that we've got one question which <laughs> has been liked a lot which is asking where your t-shirt's from all right <laughs> um yeah so uh lucia perez diaz a friend of mine who's now at halliburton used to and is still associated with oxford university she designed this this t-shirt so i highly recommend you go and buy one i think it's from teespring.com um and, the, and um, yeah, there's not many black geoscientists, that's for sure. Uh, and, the, and, the, and, the, and and all the merchandise on there and the, the money goes to a good cause. So I, I highly recommend you, you look at that. Yeah, I think it speaks to this idea that we really want everyone and all types of people to be working on these things because, you know, especially like in a field like geology, it's an it's you're looking at the entire world you know everyone is affected by these things whether you live next to an active volcano or not so it's it's great to try and encourage everyone to be able to take part yeah everybody's got um, interest in how things you know how the earth works and emotional and kind of you know your your values are to be better and trying to help other people so as as scientists it's 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 not just about the science right there's this kind of there can be and there should be kind of a moral driver for wanting to find things out and to understand the earth better because it can protect other people and it can just add to the body of knowledge which 
enriches everybody's lives really and, and people who aren't sitting just next to you the other scientists but people on the other side of the planet yeah absolutely it makes me think of um i didn't realize this until recently but actually the the right to benefiting from science is actually included in the declaration of human rights so absolutely everyone in the world has the right to be able to take part and benefit from from all these different fields absolutely um, so I'm going to move back to some more science questions. We've got one that quite a few people are interested in, which is asking if we can use the energy of active volcanoes as green energy. I don't know if that's a uh -huh. possibility. Uh -huh. <laughs> You're making me think of putting like a massive steam engine above the lava lake in Niragongo. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, you can. And um, so not probably yeah, not in the case of going to a lava lake and sort of maybe directly interacting with that because it's like 850 degrees Celsius. In areas where there's volcanoes, so like the Virunga volcanic province where Niragongo and Naimulagira are, and in places like Iceland and in places like um, the East, you know, other bits of the East African Rift, uh, north, you know, Pacific Northwest of the US, these highly volcanic areas, one one property of those areas is, is they're very hot in terms of beneath our feet and that's because there's lots of magma and there's lots of fluids which are coming off that magma which are hot in the rocks and so if you've heard of something called geothermal energy and that's how we would pump say cold water down into the earth heat it up using the natural heats within the rocks in these hot areas get it back up and then we could use turbines and use you know use the steam to to create energy that's why these volcanic terrains are very, um, you know, uh, what would you say? They're kind of better areas to do it in than probably in, you know, West London where I am, where the heat flow, the, the heat of the rocks beneath my feet is lower than in these volcanic areas. So absolutely, but that question sort of relates to a broader area than just one volcano itself, most likely. It's in the kind of overall um, volcanic province. So, Another question that we've gotten, which kind of speaking about um, volcanoes being kind of around globally, are there many extinct volcanoes in the UK and how do you recognise them? And also, how many have you personally visited, if any? <laughs> um, yes, there are. Um, yes, there are extinct volcanoes in the UK and they're so old um, that they've been heavily eroded and you might not even be able to tell that they're volcanoes or there were volcanoes there. So one really good example is Arthur's Seat and sort of, you know, Edin in Edinburgh, a, a lot of the hills in Edinburgh, are these volcanic hills and, the, and the, their age are they're carboniferous. So 350 million years old. So there's, there, there were old volcanoes there. And, you know, because 350 million years have passed, they've been eroded down. So they look like low relief hills. They don't look like a great big triangular cone. The Lake District in that area, North Wales as well. And one way we, so just to go back to the question, one way we kind of know there were volcanoes there is because we've lost that triangular shape. The products of the volcanism we can still see, the lava flows. We can see pyroclastic flows, these big like um, eruptions, you know, when volcanoes blow their top and the pyroclastic flows that come down the side, we see those in the rock record now. So if you've ever been to Snowdon, in North Wales or you've ever been to the Lake District where I used to go camping on holiday as a child. A lot of the rocks there are volcanic rocks. So that is the fingerprint of ancient volcanic activity. One thing that blows my mind still is where I'm from in Derbyshire. Um, and I remember kind of going walking with my dad a few times and um, he had this like guidebook to nature. And um, he was like, oh, you know, there's supposed to be some old lavas around here. And I was like looking around, you know, there's a big valley with limestone and an ice cream van and a river next to us. And there are, there's old carboniferous um, uh, deposits. So there used to be volcanoes in Derbyshire, which I kind of blew my mind as a child. And they're very cryptic, you know, there's these lava flows and these deposits which claim from volcanoes, which now we don't see, but we see these very, these kind of indelible, but very subtle uh, indicators of them. So yeah, we, we have volcanoes all around us. They're just probably not gonna pop anytime soon. I find the aspect that in geology, I mean, when you're studying geology, you're looking at these features that are, you know, so old and may have been huge one time, but obviously they change over time and being able to kind of understand how that's happened. 
Um, and, you know, you were talking about quite small features that kind of disappear over time, but uh, Emilio is asking about the Mariana Trench um, and how deep it, is it and <laughs> is it related to volcanic activity? I don't know if you know the numbers off the top of your <laughs> you know, head. <laughs> this is like one of those questions people ask geologists and it's one of those things you probably should know the answer to, right? It's like, it's like how big is Mount Everest? If you don't know the answer, you lose your geology badge. <laughs> Yes, you get points taken off your geology it's license. <laughs> geology <laughs> license. Uh, how deep is the Mariana Trench? Help me. I think it isn't it like five kilometers deep or something like that. He says, looking phone a friend, and um, it's very deep, and it's very dark and it's very cold, and there's an amazing life down there. And what? How is it related to volcanic activity? I can sort of talk about. So the, the Mariana Trench is an area where um, we've got something called plate subduction. So this is where the, in this case, the Pacific plate is being subducted beneath the South American plate. So the Pacific plate is here, it's dense, it's going down. And then we have this mountain range here, and you may have heard of it, called the Andes. And the Andes mountain range, which stretches a long way through South, um, through Southern South America. And that's got lots and lots of volcanoes along it. And that's because as that plate is going down, it gets hot and it actually starts to take in water and some other things we call volatiles and it starts to melt. And then that melting of that rock creates magma, that magma rises and that magma comes out at the Earth's surface in the form of volcanoes. And the Marianas Trench is just next door to that mountain range. So it's not a, it's not a coincidence you have this huge deep trench with this big mountain range which has got lots of volcanoes in it. So you spoke a lot about kind of the sea in your work like it seems like you get a lot of information by um using your techniques kind of through the ocean if that makes sense yeah. and someone is asking um whether you can use that reflection seismology technique for volcanoes that are on land rather than ones that are kind of under the seabed yes it's a very very good question so the the, the kind of short answer is yes you can you can do these um reflection seismology experiments on land as well as you can do them at sea. So you could do that and you could image ancient volcanoes deeply buried beneath the Earth's surface on land, absolutely. The reason I'm laughing is because when Expedition Volcano was being made, the reason the BBC originally contacted me was not to get involved in presenting it. They actually wanted to talk about doing an experiment, a reflection seismology experiment across Niragongo, which is covered in, you know, armed groups, and rainforests and gorillas. But they thought, you know, somehow we'd be able to go with all these detonators and dynamite and all this kind of like crazy expensive stuff and like put paths through the rainforest and look underneath near Gongo. And clearly that's not gonna happen. It's super hard for all of the reasons I just listed. So, <laughs> you know, there's a notion that technique's useful. There's a notion that that technique could be used wherever you wanted to use it. And there's a good reason, of course, to understand what's beneath near Agongo for the reasons I kind of talked about a little bit in this talk. But that area is environmentally just very, very difficult to deploy this technique in. So, uh, yeah, yeah, brings back some memories. Yeah, it sounds like you had quite a unique experience. And, you know, science always has challenges, but I think doing that kind of field work in that kind of environment is probably one of the one of the biggest challenges that that you can face as a scientist. <laughs> um, yeah. So that kind of I kind of want to focus a bit more on kind of your personal experience and interests um, in becoming a researcher. We have Oliver who's asking what inspired you to be interested in volcanoes specifically opposed to like other aspects of geology although I know you do work on other aspects too if I'm not mistaken yeah yeah, yeah I'm, I'm not very good at lots of things there's <laughs> another way of that. I, I, yeah I'm uh, you know you might you might you might if you if you think of a scientist think of somebody looking in a test tube um you know, scientists work on like one element or one cell type their whole lives, and I kind of made a career somehow about uh, by being confused about lots of things. Um, and so, yeah, I kind of came to um, so you know, my my main interest is more generally about um, thinking about how the Earth's crust deforms and how the landscapes evolve in deep time, so tens to hundreds of millions of years ago. Um, 
so I think you know I'm kind of I'm, I'm very much interested in, in in that and then it was more recently when I kind of bumped into Craig and Chiliang and people like this where you suddenly realize that this technique which has been used historically looking for oil and gas and then it can be used for looking at mountain building and rift valleys can then be deployed and used to understand volcanoes and it's that I find really interesting because what that says is something about the technique you're using and then where you can push that rather than I have this particular thing I'm interested in. I'm going to explore it in lots of different countries. Here you can be led by the technique. And so, you know, in my career, you know, I'm not super old yet. I can foresee in my career using this technique for other problems. You know, if people say, Chris, you know, where would reflection seismology be useful? I'll, I'll, I'll go and look at those problems. But I just think this, this idea of, you know, these amazing people working on active volcanoes, you know, what I would consider true volcanologists, you know, that we looking at ancient volcanoes could also be, um, be um, kind of helpful, really. OK, so we have time for a couple more questions. We're almost going to wrap up. Um, that kind of leads me on to when you were talking about using the technique for kind of other aspects. Um, there was one question that was asking about whether this method or this technique can be used on other planets. Um, I'm assuming, you know, land based planets, not like gas planets. <laughs> <laughs> Although I don't know, I'm not a geologist. So. I'm not a geophysicist either. Um, yeah, yeah. So you, you can use geophysical techniques on other planets. There's a bunch of challenges about, yeah, how you interpret the results and things. But yes, you can if you've got a rocky planet. Um, I, yeah, and there are there are missions to do. There there are presently missions looking at ge deployment of geophysical techniques on other planets. And it's amazing, isn't it, to think that, you know, we've, we've still got so many questions about the Earth and yet we're still able as, you know, as, as inquisitive, an inquisitive kind of group of people to go and ask those questions on another planet without fully understanding our own planet yet as well. But, you know, I think I, I think just that advancement of science being, you know, just not being earthbound in our questions is, is, is good. I think it's good because it helps inspire people. You know, if you start to talk about planetary sciences, maybe that brings to the table people who may don't think they've got a, a place um you know looking at earth problems yeah I, I always kind of wish that i could become an astronaut but i'm not sure the <laughs> space <laughs> life is for me but <laughs> i know there are people in Peru who are working on kind of space sciences and that's really that's really fascinating work as well um so just to end i guess because we've only got a couple of minutes um someone has asked Throughout your career, what was your all-time favourite moment? I think that would be a kind of nice question to finish on. Uh, my all-time favourite moment in the volcano, sorry. Uh, in your career, I think, but yeah. volcano to you, both. <laughs> oh, right, okay, my all-time favourite moment in my career. Um, I, 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 for some reason, I have this really strong memory of sitting in a pub in Manchester called The Drop-In, which is in South Manchester. And I'd, I'd had an interview for my PhD in the morning and I'd been awarded the PhD. They sort of and, the, and I was sitting there with my mum and dad who, who happened to be in town and I was trying to explain to them what a PhD was. And my dad just turned around to me and said, you're just going to carry on looking at rocks. And I was like, basically, and here I am, you know, a couple of decades later and, and, and that's the truth. So that is a very, that's kind of a very strong memory and like trying to explain to people why you cared about looking at rocks. In terms of the volcano, what memory do I have there? It's probably talking to the, the people, the interviews with the people who lived around the volcano and they're, they're kind of like stoic and very reflective nature about living next to this crazy big, seemingly super dangerous thing. And they were just there selling vegetables saying, yeah, you know, there's a gift and a curse and, you know, and, and you know, it brings life, but it can take life away. Just that depth of, of, of understanding and 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 ease with which they, they handled that landscape, I think was probably the thing I took from that whole experience ahead of the, the abseiling and stuff like that. Okay, and I kind of like, I have one very quick final question, um, which is another test on your geology certificate, Chris. Why uh, is a volcano called a volcano? Uh, okay, um, yeah, thanks. So I, again, this is, I think this is a, I think you have to answer this one for your, volcano, your, your geology license. But doesn't it come from like the island of Vol Vulcano, north of Sicily, um, in Italy, and it's from the, the, 
the the god the goddess of um, the, the, the god of fire in Roman mythology, I think, and didn't like they forge things in the in the in the crucible of fire and and yeah. Yeah, I think is that is that right? I'm I'm waiting for a thumbs up in the chat. I don't know. Uh, I have no idea, but maybe someone can get back to you. If I think you, that's right. If you've got it totally yeah. wrong. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds about right. Okay, so I think we'll wrap it up there. Okay. Um yeah, thank you so much. Um Professor Jackson for your really great talk. Um, I hope you've enjoyed yourself. Thank you everyone for submitting questions. We're sorry you we can get through all of them, but there are like, I can see over 70 right now. So <laughs> clearly, <laughs> clearly there's a lot of interest in this work. Um, so yeah, thanks for joining our first event. Um, we've got some more Science Breaks events coming up. So the next one will be on the 16th of July, uh, same time, 12.30 p.m. with Michelle Doherty. Um, who is a professor of space physics at Imperial. She's done some amazing work um, on different kind of missions. So I would highly recommend joining for that. And yeah, thanks for tuning in. Thanks to Professor Jackson and thanks to everyone involved in making the event. Enjoy the rest of your day.